Abe, we are in the pavilion designed by your father here at Chateau Lacoste. And I would like to understand his spirit, in fact. What was his obsession, you think? My, my Richard's obsession, I think, was life. You know, he really believed in life, in the human, in culture. He was a visceral man. And he loved this, he loved to dive into the, the politics and the culture of life. And uh, the first thing when we see the exhibition is about colors. You are dressed in colors, of course. Of course, I'm dressed to camouflage in the exhibition so you cannot see me when, I, when <laughs> I'm in, just my eyes. Yes, beautiful eyes, in fact. And <laughs> so um, why, why, why did he use all these colors in his work and even himself, like you are dressed in colors? Well, I think he, he wanted to, uh, to celebrate life. He wanted to celebrate the activities of the architecture. So he used color to highlight them. You know, I think we sit in nature surrounded by green, you know, vibrant yellow green pine leaves, with the, the different greens of the countryside and the blues of the sky. Yes. So, the, so why can't the architecture borrow from this, this world and we use the pinks of the flowers for the walls? In a way for me here, the fluorescent pink really represents his personality or his smell. You know, it's this essence of the man I wanted to try to put inside the, the space. And he was, a, he was a, a very alive person who wanted to disturb the, the norm. So to bring in this, this ah, to disturb the norm was a key thing, right? I think so. To disturb the norm and to, to bring about to make, to wake us up in a way, like when we walk into a to the blue sky, we come alive. To walk into the fluorescent pink, it's hard not to smile. But where where does these colors come from? You think? I think from you know, I think from the observations of things around for his love of art, but also from his mother. I think there was when he designed uh, Parkside, which is the project that begins everything and contains the DNA of so much of his work. He creates these incredible, vibrant, moving panels. Could you speak about this project? Yeah, I mean, Parkside was, was designed in '67 for his mother and his father, Nino and Dada, and was a was an ultra modern. A uh, series of porthole frames um, wrapped up in insulated prefabricated components to, to create this very simple box and inside inside this very simple box there was just a long kitchen some sliding doors a bathroom a bedroom two bedrooms and a, and a study but because of the openness of the plan 12 meters by 12 meters 144 square meters you could reprogram it very easily if you wanted to extend it, you could continue the rhythm of the wow. of the beams. If you wanted to, so over the years, this very simple system has been inhabited by many different people. So, including my grandmother. Then I lived there. Then, uh, then my office I placed in the second building there, um, and then some young art students took it over. Then it was renovated, and Harvard ran a foundation there and now is art students living there again, and then it will become a national monument for the National Trust. So it's this, this ability for this building to take on these different personalities. And when I say it contains much of the DNA of his work, you know, it's completely legible. You can see all the structure. You understand how it stands up. Mm. It's transparent. You can see straight the way through it, like the Pompidou transparent, like the Pompidou legible. Um, you can see all the workings like the, like the Pompidou. You can continue the rhythm of the construction to, to, to expand it. But uh, in, so in a way he invented these colors. Yeah, then I think with his, with his, with his mother, they, they, they developed this, these incredible colors for the house, which is based on personalities. In the Pompidou, they do a very simple thing, which is they say, okay, we have all these pipes carrying different services. Let's borrow from the language of the drawings. Mm -hmm. So red is fire, blue is, is air, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and we translate this to but the But there the were two on this project. There were, there were two supported by many, Renzo and, and Richard. Yes, so uh, what belongs to whom? I think uh, Richard was more interested in disturbing and Renzo was, 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 was more interested in building. And so this became this very beautiful dialogue. And you can see where the, where the work, what happens to them after the partnership separates. They stay best friends. Right. They're huge uh, admirers of each other's work. And they continue to do great things in very different, in very different ways, with very different studios. And so to be, to be disturbing the people means that you are, you are attacked. 
People, well, some people are aggressive. How did he take that? Well, I think whenever the early projects, whenever they open, they are not well accepted. But after time, they become, they become, of course. They become absorbed by the culture. But uh, uh, in the moment, instantly, so, how did he accept a, that? It's it very was painful, right? Yeah, painful, but he had an amazing inner confidence to, wow. to believe in, 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 in the work. And he would not be that, he would not be affected by the, by the, the, the press. He, he knew what he was doing was for the people and it, was gonna, it just was going to take time for culture to catch up with him. And these places become really iconic. But he always told a lovely story of sitting in the rain outside the Pompidou and a woman offering him an umbrella and him chatting to the woman. And the woman says, he says to the woman, ha, I designed this, this monument in front of us. And she looked at him horrified and removed the umbrella <laughs> and walked off. So it was fun in a way. Yeah, I think he was, he was extremely strong. He was extremely strong. Yeah. Wow, that's very and, impressive. And passionate. He had this passion, this strength, and this belief, and this belief in what he was in what he was doing. Well, and when we we go from one project to another year, I think he has an uh, obsession for waves too. His obsession for waves, but there's also an obsession for learning. So it, each project is is the com is a conversation continuous. And the idea is developing. He was really, he really loved the new. He loved modernity. He loved the, the he loved the shock of the of, of of the new. This was something he was always engaging with. He was fearful of the past, and really believed in the in in in, in the future. So he was always trying to 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 push these ideas. But forward. for example, did he ever refer to the fact that Greek and Roman as a building painted and their sculpture painted? Uh, yes, he, he, was, he was very interested in the Greeks, the Romans, in the Renaissance, but also he, in, it, this architecture is also very legible. And you, see, you know, he would talk about Notre Dame and the flying buttresses of Notre Dame when ah. explaining the Pompidou. For him, you know, walking past Notre Dame, he would take me there with this, with this passion for this, this, this again, muscular, uh, very descriptive, very legible architecture. You know, going to Brunelleschi's dome, you see, you know, the, the, you know, you talk of confidence. This is, this is, you know, the, you have Brunelleschi sitting there saying, "This dome will work. I promise you. No one has built something like it before." You know, and 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 he, you know, the, the confidence to, to believe in the structure, mm -mm. and I think this gave him greater a great belief to know these stories of the past, to know to know the heroics of Hadrian and the Pantheon. You know. And how did you choose the projects here? Here, mm. I chose the projects. I was really interested in the political projects, which were mainly from public, uh, public clients, or the unbuilt, which are all ideas around housing. Um, but for me, really, all, what these projects all represent is architecture as a manifesto. So they are campaigning for a belief in a, in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in an evolving society and how architecture can change, how it can stay ahead, how it can be future-proof, how it can, uh, it, it can embrace the public, the civic, how it can talk to the city and to the people, how it can welcome, how it can make justice uh, transparent. Uh, Piano said he had a kind of civic strength. He had a civic passion. You know, he, was, he worked very closely with the mayor of Barcelona, or the three mayors of Barcelona, the, the mayor, two mayors of London, with the, the mayor of Shanghai and the mayor of Paris. You know, so he has this, and for him, he was passionately trying to change the cities. For him, architecture was a, was a way of, 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 de of manifesting his ideas, not just the other way around. And so he was extremely optimistic? Extremely optimistic. And he was, he was really, you know, what we've tried to do here is, is, to, is to reduce the language, to be really about the ideas, to re also to reduce the material that we're showing these drawings are diagrams or principles or concepts of ideas and not to, to hide in intellectual language but to use very honest, very direct communication. And his buildings are also like a big futuristic machine. Yeah. With a kind of extravagance to it, right? I think there's an extravagance, there's a, but again this is this opulence, this passion, this optimism. Come inside, take part, join me. You know, he really, he, he loved working with artists, bringing them inside, whether it's Tingley or Nicky Sanfao, you know, there's this real passion. And I, he had the Nicky Sanfao- The artist? With the artists. Le, wo, wo, to, dis, to disturb as well, it, to, to create surprise. What are the other artists he worked with? Uh, I mean, many across the, uh, 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 across, across the years. But I guess this, the, um, 
the languages that you know he he going to see Philip Gustin shows bring him you know, ah. a smile. And again, when Philip Gustin, you see this real visceral sense. This real and the, this, and the this, special this, colors and these very special colors. And they are uh, Gustin. Have you yeah, seen it? Completely. now, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then it's, it's you know, and so it's, it's these interrelationships. Um, the Kooning, you know. But did he happen to know uh, Gaston? Yes, he happened to know Gaston. Ah, such interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because well, he's red too. Completely. But also his wife was brought up in Woodstock, Rufi, and was, there, there, was a, there, was a, there was a there was a great friendship with, 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 with Philip. And so what's your last project you show in the... Well, of course, the last project we show is, 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 is the drawing gallery. And in a way, for me, this is a return to the beginning. It is very, you know, strip away everything unnecessary, remove all the workings and put them on the outside to keep the, the box clean on the inside. Here is a box. So it becomes really like a, a viewing platform. A viewing cathedral, you said? A viewing, a viewing platform. Or ah. Even more so, maybe we can call it a, um, a camera obscura. You know, it frames ah, this amazing, true. it frames this amazing view, like a telescope, with these natural light at both ends pouring in, and then we use the interior to occupy it with with drawings of objects, with drawings of ideas. And uh, what do you think he will think today about artificial intelligence? Uh, he, you know, he loved technology. He loved. Yes, that's know, why. So he would, he would, he would even, you know, people like Kevin Kelly. You know the kind of hive mentality. Find this very, very interesting, as I did. I think he would be. He would not be threatened by it at all, but would love to play with it. To embrace. To embrace it and to work with it. Mm. And uh, uh, just to finish, let's speak about the beginning and Yale. Do you think it uh, influenced him a lot to be? Of course, at Yale he meets Norman, and he meets he meets he meets you know all the great Americans. He falls in love with Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but what was the interaction between Norman Foster and you? They worked together, they set up a unit, they did urban planning, they created, you know, they were really looking at kind of different types of, of, of housing. They also did a huge experience going to study the case study houses, to see Schindler, to see Wright, um, to see Eames. But and it was less business oriented than some others, right? Well, I think he set his office up as a charity. He was, you know, he, always, he had these kind of socialist principles. He was, he had very good business people around him. Ah. Uh, which kept the, but, but the practice worked in a very radically different way, in a very different way from some, some, some others. And so he decided to retire one day. He decided, yeah, he slowed, well, he never really retired. He, you know, he continued designing until the very end. He decided to step down as the, 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 as the chairman. But, but it, he, it's but quite rare, no? Yeah. To retire, yeah, yeah, but he can, he was drawing. You know, the treehouse was maybe the last project. Even though this wasn't finished, the drawing the drawing gallery was not finished. But the treehouse was it, it, this the, the drawing gallery being designed, and the treehouse, which is this concept of democratizing architecture, where you build a factory for the for the, the timber construction at the base, and then you very quickly assemble these kind of prefabricated components. And what is the roof of one becomes the becomes the garden to the next. And it's this idea, outside every window, you can see a tree. And one of his favorite quotes is that it should be a human right for everybody to see a tree outside their window. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. And we know that in a hospital, if you can see a tree through your window, you reduce the need for pain relief by 25%. Wow. So it's this very, very direct, you know, by, by, a, by a filia. Mm. You know, it really goes back to our, to our kind of our, our primal instinct. And he was, he was very much uh, interested by sustainability Early yeah. on, huh? Well, I think if you go back to Zip Up House, this was prefabricated, insulated construction, and even in the illustration, there's a there's a plug-in battery for the car. Oh wow! Bon, merci beaucoup. No, thank merci. you. I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you.